This morning, we want to continue with our workout sessions on spiritual fitness by focusing on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this morning, we are going to be reading from chapter 4, verses 14, or excuse me, 17 to 24. In this particular passage, Paul is insisting that the Ephesians turn away from their old pagan ways and live according to Christ and new life in Christ. So Paul wants to instruct the Ephesians that learning Christ is not simply talking about ideas. It's actually taking on a new, a whole new way of life. So hear now these words from Scripture, chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. And there are some self-examination questions in your bulletin this morning, and I hope those will become clear later in the sermon. Paul writes, Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. This is not the way you learn Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lust, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, this is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. And let us pray together. Oh Lord, teach us again what it means to follow in the way of Christ. Teach us to put away the old and to clothe ourselves in the new. For Jesus' sake, amen. It is indeed good to be back with you. I'm always thankful for the opportunities to learn, and I appreciate very much the time I had with friends and colleagues across the pond, as they say. But it was a real blessing, so thank you. Now with traveling, of course, come many opportunities. When we travel to different places, we are able to learn new things and visit new people. Now over the last year or so, I have been going to England, and when I have gone, I have typically flown into Heathrow International Airport in London. It is, as some of you may know, a massive, very large place, a key transportation hub in Europe. Now, when I arrive in Heathrow, I usually take the underground or the tube to King's Cross Rail Station, and then I get on the train. And from there, I travel to Durham in the north. And to say the least, dear friends, it is quite an adventure. But as with anything new, I've had to learn. And I've had to learn how to navigate a large, crowded airport and a huge subway system and a national train system. And at first, I found it all very complicated. 
and I didn't know exactly what to do or where to go. Indeed, I am sure I looked like the proverbial lost American, asking for directions. But after several times at it now, I think I've picked it up. What I need to do and where I need to go, and it all makes more sense having figured out how it all works. It just takes practice, and sometimes it takes time. Now, the other thing that I have learned, though, when traveling, is how to travel light. To the extent that I can, I have learned again to go with carry-on luggage, amen? And not worry about the hassle of the luggage getting lost or waiting in long lines to retrieve it. Get in, get out, get moving. That's my motto. Now, to those who travel a great deal, I am sure you can relate to that feeling you may have when you watch your baggage go down the conveyor belt never to be seen again. And hours later, and the luggage has strangely disappeared. Nowhere to be found. You know the feeling? And there you are in the airport, no clean clothes, no toiletries, nothing, and it suddenly occurs to you that the airlines each and every year, on average, lose about 26 million bags. So what's one more bag? Especially if it's yours. Another suitcase gone. Reminds me of the story of the person who was standing in the line to buy an airline ticket. And as he stepped up to the counter with three bags of luggage, he said, ma'am, I want this first suitcase to go to Phoenix. And then he said, I want this next one to go to Seattle. And then I want the third one to go to New York. And dumbfounded, the attendant said, well, sir, we just can't do that. And the man said, I don't know why not. You did it last week. <laughs> get in, get out, get going. And yet, and yet, there's also the case of not simply traveling light, but of getting rid of the luggage altogether. And by that, I mean not the kind of luggage that weighs us down physically, but the kind of luggage that weighs us down spiritually, that can destroy relationships, damage families, sour loved ones, hurt those close to us bring corporations, nations, and organizations to naught, and even take us away from God. And learning how to let go of this luggage, this baggage, is what learning Christ is all about. That is, as we learn what it means to be spiritually fit, we learn, perhaps, sometimes awkwardly, what it means to let go of the old stuff and to put on and to take up the new stuff in Christ that leads us into a relationship with Christ. And our passage today addresses this matter head on. As Paul is clear that the Ephesians can no longer keep on carrying the old baggage from the lives that they were leading in the past, which keeps them in places of darkness and ignorance and hardness of heart. They must learn instead that the Christian life is about the process of letting go of the old and taking hold of the new. That is to say, whatever is corrupt and harmful, Whatever prevents us from seeing reality clearly, whatever 
keeps us in a state of alienation from God and from others. Whatever leads to insensitivity and to a lack of compassion. Whatever keeps us in the vices of arrogance and deceit and greed and recklessness, put it away. Take it off. That's not what it means to learn Christ. Rather, learning Christ involves learning who Jesus was and what he did. It is learning about Jesus himself and what he is all about. It means allowing Jesus' whole life, his teachings, his character, his death, his resurrection, to have their full effect on us. Stressing that the key to this new way of life will come through the heart and the head and the soul. And that once the head and the heart and the soul are changed, a new life is born in the spirit. Learning Christ involves the whole person. Indeed, learning Christ is not necessarily about sitting around a seminar table talking about ideas, though that's important. And it's not about our feelings, though those are important. And it's certainly not about standardized tests or multiple choice. No, learning Christ is about actually doing and saying the specific things Jesus said and did. The great writer, popular author, Dallas Willard of Southern California University asked a question that may sound a bit shocking, but it is so self-evident. He asked a conference of church leaders once, when was the last time they had had or heard of a group or of a church of any kind have a meeting to discuss how they were going to teach people to do what Jesus said and did. In what church did they see that happening? And there were no hands. Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Evangelical. How were the people in these churches learning to do what Jesus said and did? Or how were they learning what Willard calls the curriculum for Christ likeness. I like that phrase. The curriculum for Christ likeness. I am very much convicted about this. I mean, the classes that we offer, the services and the outreach that we seek to provide, the groups that we try to create, all point, we pray to this curriculum for Christ-likeness. At least that's the goal. That's the hope. From giving blood to walking in a harvest walk to helping with Operation Bundle Up to serving with the children to having a Bible study, there is a whole curriculum for learning Christ. A whole curriculum. And in the lobby, it's a cliche, I know. But when we ask people to sign up, we are asking people to be involved in this curriculum for Christ-likeness. The projects, the groups, the classes, and all these offerings are not there just to look good. And they're not there to say, well, isn't that special? No. They are there in some small but hopefully meaningful way of learning what we can do to do what Jesus said and did. Because sitting in church for one hour a week doesn't cut it. It never has. Rather, it's about sharing in God's own life. At some level, at some level, For if there's one thing that Jennifer and I have learned over the years, 
It is that if we are leaving something out of the curriculum, let us know. We can always use more ideas, more teachers, more opportunities for fellowship, more servants. Because if this curriculum for Christ's likeness that we are offering means anything, if it means anything at all, it will mean that we all together are learning to walk as Jesus walked and to have his mind in us. It means at least those two, those two things. It will mean that we are actually shedding calories. That's great. And flexing our muscles when we learn and we'll have our brain cells stimulated because our faith is seeking understanding. Or as C.S. Lewis contended, our minds are actually being open to a whole new world. And we learn to live differently. And we learn to cultivate virtue like honesty, generosity, faithfulness, all because we are learning Christ. Let's think of it another way. Think of how Jesus used all kinds of ways to teach and to communicate. Think about that. I mean, if we were followers of Jesus in Jesus' day, we would have heard parables and stories, right? We would have seen demonstrations of power in miracles. We would have witnessed rebukes to his disciples and sermons in synagogues and on hillsides. We would have learned by doing as Jesus would have sent us out to teach and to heal. We would have had to walk from place to place just to keep up as Jesus' classroom was wherever he was. So did these disciples learn Jesus. Jesus through sermons and parables and arguments and miracles, and they actually learned by doing, which is awkward. Indeed, we might see these disciples as apprentices on the job in the school of hard knocks, getting their PhDs in ministry. And by PhD, I mean in preaching, healing, and discipleship. Isn't that a great PhD to have? And everyone here can have it in ministry. That's the kind of PhD we all need. Because too many times we just talk, but we don't do to learn Jesus. So let me ask you this question. Who taught you to learn Christ? Who was it that taught you Christ? And where were you when that happened? Do you remember where you were? What impact has it had on your life? What did you do? What did they, what did they say? What did they do? What was so important to you? And are these people still important to you? But let me ask you this question also. What are you doing to continue to learn Christ? What small group are you in? What ministry are you involved with? What area matters to you? I believe that a church that seeks to be a center of spiritual fitness will try to develop and to live out Jesus' curriculum. It will depict the Christian life as a journey of ups and downs, twists and turns, and moments of going sideways and, yes, even backwards. But all with the goal of knowing that Christ has the final victory. It will understand that the church is not a place where we're going to have all the answers, but as a place where we all journey together, who find life difficult, 
a place for people who know they are broken and even damaged, maybe even hurt by the church itself. It will be a place where the spiritually flabby and unfit can come to work out. Where people can work through their troubles toward the maturity that God wants to produce in them. That's the kind of church Christ wants. The kind that is open about its own problems and misunderstandings, seeing them not as something out of the normal, but as an opportunity to grow in grace. It is the reality of the church as it is, in all of its bewildering <laughs> grace and even conflict, which is the classroom for learning Jesus. Not as some perfect ideal, which the church never is. Even in England, it ain't perfect. But it is the place where we can discover life in Christ amidst the putting off of the old and the putting on of the new. May this be the place.